Steve Kerwood has been for 25 years executive producer and host of NPR's award-winning weekly environmental news program, Living on Earth. I'm sure that most, if not all of us, have, have heard that show plenty of times. And um, Steve has a new, uh, recently formed relationship with, with UMass. He's here at uh, in the uh, School for the Environment. Um, Living on Earth is now being uh, beamed to 300 stations nationwide. Um, and in the 25 years that Steve has been running this show, he's addressed virtually every aspect of the human relationship with the natural environment, um, including species extinction, of course, population growth, human population growth, uh, the loss of wilderness areas and open space, also the health impacts of, uh, of pollution, and also of climate change. And um, I think that uh, Steve has been doing good journalism on this subject uh, since uh, since a time when when people um, at large didn't know about it, and global warming wasn't really even a household word. Um, and as such, I, I'm very interested to see what he has to say about the uh, the role of the press and whether the press has fulfilled its role in clarifying some of these issues uh, for the you know, non-scientific public and, and of keeping this, um, this challenge in our consciousness. I think most of us here would agree that the press has been rather weak on this, uh, on this, uh, uh, this, this challenge, this responsibility. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, Steve will be able to um, give some reasons and explanations as to why that, that tends to be the case. Steve. Thank you, Ryan Mark. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, session. Um, I do, uh, uh, you know, I do radio, and that means a schedule, so I'll be leaving actually fairly quickly given where we are on the uh, on the clock right now um, and I'll be anxious to hear uh, but I won't be able to participate in the panel afterwards I, I, I fear but we have a few minutes left um, so um, because this came onto my calendar as, as ending at 315 is what the invite that I got and it's five minutes from now I'll take a little more than that but not a lot more I'm afraid um, so, we can probably explain the press with just one word, Trump. <laughs> you know, in this society, um, we have uh, we've evolved a system of now more and more it's so-called news um, that revolves around profits, uh, ratings, um, and good old-fashioned titillation. So uh, it's uh, no surprise that when it comes from anything uh, to our elective politics, I mean what Professor Swim was talking about, uh, gender differences in addressing um, what we call environment, you could look at our political spectrum as well. Why do you see so many more women in the Democratic column in this particular race than you see in the Republican column. What, what, what's that all about? And that will be an interesting discussion because I see a lot of parallels there. Um, but uh, for today, though, um, I want to talk about a couple of things. First, a big picture. I think sometimes we make a mistake to pigeonhole this issue as environment. Um, for many years, for more than a century in this country, we've talked about conservation. And conservation was actually something very Republican, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, granted, Roosevelt killed as many animals as he identified, I think. But we have allowed things to be narrowed down. Environment is not, uh, is not, a, not, not a great heading for this. I think much more what we should be talking about is our society. And the fact is, Today, this planet is engaged in a fundamental 
revolution as big as the beginning of agriculture. Because for us to survive, and we heard from my esteemed colleague from Bowdoin, um, a litany of, you know, the dark side of looking at this. For us to survive, we have to change the way we operate as a species on the planet. Now, a disadvantage for, for us Americans is that we think that America is the world. And when you talk about the press, and you talk about what other nations are doing, the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, is really taking this climate thing very seriously. You really, America is the only place where there's been much action on skepticism, for example. Now, I'm pleased and in our broadcast this week we'll be talking about how the uh, New York Attorney General has been joined by Massachusetts Attorney General and the Virgin Islands Attorney General in uh, investigating Exxon's uh, alleged misinformation campaign. But this is, um, you know, we're kind of Johnny come lately, or if there are more women involved, Jane come lately to addressing this. So what's going on? We've seen this movie before. And I think one way that we saw this movie before uh, in this country is called slavery. Shortly before the Civil War, the value of slaves held in southern households was greater than the value of the real estate greater than the value of the real estate. Also, in about 1830, as much as 20, 25% of Southerners held slaves. Just before the Civil War, it was down to 4%. Does that sound like Bernie here? Down to 4%. 96% of the white populace didn't own slaves before the Civil War. 1830 to 1860, America quadrupled the number of slaves. Why? Because we started speculating in people. We've seen it in tulips, we've seen it in housing, and in this case in America, it was done in people. Guess what? People are like cows or horses, they reproduce, and if you have people who are willing to spend more and more, you can make more and more from this. And except you need more territory. So when we look back at that history, well, what was the fight about uh, Texas or Missouri or all that kind of stuff? The people who were speculating in people needed more territory so there could be more plantations, where there could be more slaves, where there'd be more demand, and the price of slaves could keep going up and up and up. Because at the end, a good working slave was, a really good working slave was the, 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 the price of an automobile. Somehow we couldn't get our heads around this as a society to address in a peaceful way. Somehow we couldn't come up with a solution that worked in a nonviolent fashion. So instead that 4% in the South who, by the way, control the various legislature, because if you have a big plantation, naturally you're going to be the representative who goes to Charleston or um, you know, various other capitals in the South. So, um, and they saw that they would lose all in this change. So they dug in their heels. They dug in their heels in a horrible way. And we know the consequences of that. And we still haven't really recovered from that. We call it racism in America, and it certainly is race-based. But what it really was about was greed. Unabashed greed. That it was okay to own another person and to make a lot of money on that. Now we have the same problem with the planet. We think that we can own nature. We think that we can enslave nature. I mentioned that we're part of the world. The solution, this huge change that we have to go through right now, 
depends on, yes, we have to change our behavior, but we're really dependent on much of the rest of the world. For example, if you do the math about the rise, uh, the, the carbon flux, simply cutting deforestation in the tropical areas would save about a third of that. You know, most of the time when people do the carbon budget with, uh, with forests, they look, they, they, they take what it saves and then they add what being chopped and they say, well, it's about a 10% effect. No, if you ignore the fact that we're deforesting and just see what the activities are, the, the ability of, of the, biota, the biota to sequester carbon uh, in these areas, just the tropics I'm talking about, it's, it's, it's pushing 30%. It's a crazy number. And guess what? For a tiny amount of money, relatively speaking, we could stop cutting in the tropical areas overnight. There's no technology required. It's just called writing a big enough check and providing other economic alternatives to folks so they stop cutting down the trees. It's really very simple. You don't have to invent an electric car. You don't have to come up with a new grid. You don't have a, anything super technology. If we had the willingness, we could do this now. So, what's the problem with the press? I'm going to go back to the slavery example for a moment. So how much do the mainstream press cover the evils, both the economic evil of slavery, which is really pretty considerable, considering how it distorted the ability to be productive in the modern industrial age. Slave labor really doesn't work very well. So-called free labor, and I suspect folks who worked in the mills in Lawrence and Lowell might not have felt like they were particularly free, but, you know, legally they were. They got to go home at night. Um, So-called uh, free labor is much more economically efficient than a slave labor system. So, and then, of course, there's the morality about it. So we've enslaved nature, which is economically really inefficient for us. We consider the costs of what we're doing. And then, of course, there's the whole moral thing. Are we, should we, is it even possible for us to destroy the very basis of having not only our civilization, but also space for many of the other species on the planet? As I recall, there's not much in the mainstream press that dealt with this. There were some papers, you know, Horace Greeley famously, Tribune was on this. In this town we had William Lloyd Garrison and the, the Liberator, we had Frederick Douglass's paper, but they were over here from the mainstream. The mainstream did not really want to get its head there. So why does the press not want to do this? Because that's the way that we have fashioned our society to work today. The press is there to make money, to get the ratings, and you know what? The way we're working, covering this, the way that it really needs to be done, doesn't mesh. So, what's the solution? Well, we got out of the slave bind in a horrible, messy, disastrous way, and yet somehow we triumphed. Somehow we have an America today that is vital that has a democracy, that has free labor. So we can do it again. The question is, how much pain do we want to endure? And beyond pain, how much suffering do we want to endure? So I think as the evidence piles up, and as people begin to feel this, um, it'll happen relatively quickly. Right now in Fort Lauderdale, they are still building those huge apartment houses, selling them to people who will take out a 30-year mortgage. When Fort Lauderdale is at sea level, well, the highest part of Fort Lauderdale is nine feet, but with the limestone formation under there, the water certain times of the year is already filling the streets. I mean, they have no wake signs on some of the streets in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Sooner or later, Folks will wake up and say, oh, wait a second. Hmm. Yeah, the developer got his money when he sold me this place, but am I going to get my money out of this? No. It's guesstimated that about 
13 to 18 million people are going to have to move from low-lying areas uh, relatively soon over these coming years as things start to become inundated. And just, there's a paper that's out just in the last couple of days talking about Antarctica's melting rate is now such that it's, that alone is good for three feet of sea level. We've got Greenland, which seems to be moving at a 50-year rate of it, perhaps a meter every, uh, uh, every 50 years. So a meter out of Antarctica, a meter out of Greenland, um, plus, I'll tell you a secret, every one of these scientific projections that I've seen come out of really smart houses would look back at five or ten years later have been too cautious. Too cautious. And unlike what most scientists like, you know, everything being a consensus, the climate model that did the best was the least uncautious through all of this was the outlier. It was the Brits at the Hadley Met, uh, Met Office that had it most, more right than everybody else. So if science is saying today we're good for two meters, I don't know how this campus is at two meters, Robin tells me that it's 26 feet or something is okay here, I don't know. Um, so people are going to need to leave houses. We also know that with a high degree of confidence that the extreme hot the extreme cold is linked specifically to climate. A little less confidence about various storms. Not yet the confidence on the tornado, uh, the tornado rash that we've seen. But in essence, this evidence is going to be on us and it's everywhere in the world. We're not going to be alone on this. So, I think actually uh, we will not simply sit here and let the seas rise, let the species vanish. We will act because we're going to be compelled to act. Because we don't want to have our feet wet, because we don't want to roast. And we will take action. The action is a collective one. The choice is up to us, though. Do we have to do what America in the, 18, the middle of the, of the 19th century had to do? That is, go to war lose something like 6% of the population's casualties. That was a horrible number, right? Like 6 million people out of 100 million people die, and it's just horrible. Or can we move more proactively and do something now? Um, I happen to be the optimist. I happen to feel that there is so much going on right now that in fact we will respond and the press will get aboard. Why? Because there's so much money to be made in changing the energy system. We're talking four and a half trillion dollars to convert that. Makes the IT revolution and the dough that the Gateses and the Dells and, 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 and the Steve Jobs made look like chunk change to change the whole energy system. But to do this, we have to change our political system. Just like we had to acknowledge that every person in America is a full citizen. Not some are three-fifths. We have to have a political system that respects the rights of all of us to live, to proceed. Not one that just simply pours profits into a narrow group of folks. So the warning sign is here, folks. It was four percenters back then that caused the problem. Right now, if you listen to Bernie, it's the one percenters that have got us by the throat. Move past that, and we have a solution. So I'm excited to be here at UMass where you guys, where we are, I'm sorry I said that wrong, where we are moving forward with the understanding and realization that we have to be resilient, we have to be responsive, we have to be aware, we have to be together. Because, well, you know, I guess in this town, it was Sam Adams that said that, uh, uh, or is it, uh, who was it that said we must hang together or we will hang separately. I think it's Sam Adams, is it? No historians here? <laughs> well, it's going to be Sam Adams, maybe. <laughs> it's good beer, anyway. In this case, we all have to bail. We all have to bail us out of this together 
or we will be drowning by ourselves. Drowning literally as well as figuratively. I think, uh, I think we can do it though. I know we can do it. We gotta do it. We will do it. Because we have so many exciting ways. We have, first of all, we have information systems um, that we didn't have back in the era of the Civil War. We're able to reduce, you know, be more efficient energy. I can, you know, with this cell phone, I can have a car here in a few minutes that will cost me less than a taxi. Um, but somebody who's feeling better about driving today because he or she made that choice. And it just goes from there. I mean, smart distributed energy systems. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So we will get it, and we will get it right. But boy, oh boy, between now and then, we got a hell of a fight on our hands, and it won't always be easy. Thank you for allowing me to spend a little bit of time with you today. and um, I look forward to hearing about the, the, the later discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. It's great that you could make it. Steve's in production for the you know, weekly show right now, so it's uh, great that he could squeeze some time out for us.